My strength, my soul, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comfort.
close of the service, we're going to get, offer you a free testament, the Word of God, coming straight from God. Uh, it is free to you because people in churches in this area have donated funds to provide these scriptures. This scripture has uh, helps in the front, and it has the plan of salvation in the back. Please use this. Thank you. Let's give the Lord a hand for Gideon's International. You know that Louisiana College exists to change the world for Christ, and giving New Testaments to students is a way of doing that. I'll tell you there's another way that we're doing that, and that is through the Higher Purpose Campaign, an ambitious campaign that uh, is devoted to raising awareness and resources for Louisiana College's uh, future. Front and center, front and center in the Higher Purpose Campaign is an ambitious goal of $12, 12 million dollars to be raised for the purpose of improving student housing. Would you join me in thanking the Lord for that ambitious goal? That multi-million dollar uh, goal is a dream that will come true because of the work that the Lord is going to give us to do together. You know that over 1,600 Louisiana Baptist churches are connected with Louisiana College. There is a deep devotion to what God is doing here. And what we're doing is asking God to guide us so that we can connect with those churches so that they can be a part of making this multi-million dollar dream a reality. This dream that we thank the Lord for regarding the improvement of student housing. Now this morning, we uh, want to call attention to the fact that a number of people are sacrificing their time in order to lead this campaign to its uh, uh, victory. And this morning, I want to ask you, if you're a part of the campaign leadership team, you're a director of missions, or you serve as a Louisiana Baptist leader, or you're a pastor, or you serve in some other way, and you're here today because you are going through a tedious work schedule to, devoted to the campaign that I've just described, if you would please stand. And as they are standing, I ask the Louisiana College family to greet them. Now let's ask God to continue to, to work in us as we turn that dream into a reality. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for the fact that you have called this school to exist, to live and to breathe, so that the world can be changed through and by and in honor and glory of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank you for these leaders who are here today to work diligently on the hard task of moving that dream into a reality. We're grateful that front and center of this campaign is the multi-million dollar effort geared to improve student housing. And I pray that the connections will be made with churches through this part of the campaign so that, that uh, resources will be raised, awareness will be raised, and more than that, prayer support will be raised for what you're doing here at this fine school devoted to the work of changing the world for Christ. In whose name I pray, amen.
My name is Jade Perkins. I'm a junior pre-physical therapy major. In September of 2012, Ms. Janie Wise, the WMU Director of Louisiana, who is also with us this morning, introduced Dr. Rebecca Naylor and I to each other. It was then that I asked and began to plan a time for Dr. Naylor to come and visit us on this campus. Then in Louisville, Kentucky, in November of last year, we were able at the Global Missions Health Conference to finalize her visit. Dr. Rebecca Ann Naylor graduated from Baylor University in 1964 with a BA degree in chemistry and went on to Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, receiving the MD degree in 1968. She then became the first female resident in general surgery at Southwestern Medical Center and Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas, and completed her training in 1973. Dr. Naylor was appointed by the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, which was then the Foreign Mission Board. She was appointed as a missionary to India in 1973, and in early 1974, she arrived at the new Bangalore Baptist Hospital. She launched her missionary career that included busy clinical practice, administrative responsibility, and teaching. In 1996, she established the Rebecca Ann Naylor School of Nursing. She now serves as the global health consultant for Baptist Global Response, and she is mobilizing healthcare personnel all around the world to meet medical needs. She continues to make frequent trips to India to participate in the ongoing ministry of Bangalore Baptist Hospital. Dr. Rebecca, I'm so glad to know you, and I'm so glad you're here at LC. Fellow students, will you help me welcome Dr. Rebecca Naylor? Now, just before we get to hear from Dr. Naylor, Dr. Stanley Paul, our professor of physics, who is from the India, Dr. Naylor's favorite place, we will get to hear him lead us in worship on the violin. Just one change is guitar, not violin. <laughs> I'm going to sing uh, Psalm 23 in my mother tongue Tamil, uh, which is one of uh, many languages spoken in India. in The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. I'm gonna 
It was after midnight. It was terribly hot, oppressive heat. The site was Madras in South India. I had just arrived, hours late, a new missionary. I walked out of the arrival hall at the airport and was immediately accosted by beggars. People were going to sleep on the sidewalk. I had absolutely no idea how to get to Bangalore for I had long since missed my connection. I went to the domestic airline counter and uh, it was closed. I did find an employee back behind the counter uh, who would talk to me. He said he could not arrange my travel and he put me in a bus in the parking lot by myself. After two or three hours of isolation and many bad thoughts, um, in airline employees got in the bus and we went to town. It was 5 a.m. by the time I finally got to the hotel where I was to stay. They were rationing electricity, so the lobby was very dark. The porters were all wearing turbans. And you can well imagine what now I was thinking. I had been without sleep for about 24 hours. I was in a very strange place and the environment did not look favorable. I decided the first thing I should do was to call Bangalore and tell those people what had become of their new missionary and where I was. I did not know that in 1974 in India, you could not pick up the phone and call Bangalore. Four hours later, I finally was able to talk with them. They sent me uh, downtown to the airline office and I found that I could buy a ticket to Bangalore two days later. Welcome to India. Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn and I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God, how vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you would slay the wicked, O oh God. Away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. 
your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. King David wrote this psalm, Psalm 139, when he was surrounded by evil. This psalm reflects on the character of God and probably more than any other psalm we see here clearly defined the attributes of God. Surely God is bigger than all the evil that is around us. Now we're going to look more carefully at this psalm in detail. First of all, we see that God is omniscient. He knows. He knows actions, thoughts, words. God knew what was happening to me in India on that night so very long ago. His knowledge is perfect and it is complete. He knows us individually and personally. He knows us by name. Uh, one of my favorite Bible stories since childhood was about Zacchaeus. And I was fascinated that Jesus knew his name. You remember Jesus was walking down the road and he saw Zacchaeus in the tree and he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, come down. God knows us. He knows where we are and what we're doing. He knows when we go to class, when we go to sleep, when we rest, when we work, when we play. Everything God knows. He understands our thoughts and our reactions to the things around us. Our thoughts are really like words to God. And wherever we are, his hand is on us. His hand was on me when as a teenager, he spoke to me about personally being involved in medical missions. I was the daughter of a Baptist pastor. I had grown up in the church. Um, I knew about missions. I had prayed for missionaries. Uh, I had met missionaries. But there came that day when missionaries were speaking in our church. And God spoke to me very personally and called me into mission service. I could not imagine that God could use me to do that. I felt so insignificant. How could he possibly ask me to do something like that? And besides all that, I did not want to leave home. I did not even want to leave home to go to college, so how could I possibly go some other place that God might send me? And yet, God had a very definite plan for my life. His hand was upon me, and such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I cannot even imagine how God knows everything. I can only praise him. Then as we go further in the psalm, we see that God is omnipresent. God is present everywhere. God exists. He is spirit. We cannot see him, but we know that he sees us. Even in the most distant place, we meet God. We're never out of his reach no matter where we may be. As the psalm says, even in India, on the far side of the sea, God is there. He was there leading me. His hand was guiding me and upholding me in all of the years that I served him in that place. I knew God's presence very much in my medical practice. I have the print of a picture uh, of a painting done by a man named Green. It is the picture of an operating room. 
Uh, the patient is there, the equipment is there, the team is all there. And the picture shows Jesus standing behind the surgeon. That really depicts what I often experienced as I cared for patients and as I performed surgery. Jesus was there when my finite knowledge was limited. He was present when I was in a mud hut sitting on the dirt floor telling Bible stories about Jesus. He was there when I was lonely and far away from my family. Uh, for many years in India, I was um, not working with any Westerners or other missionaries. And there were times of loneliness, but God was always present. He was present week after week as I worshiped with my brothers and sisters in India. Some of you have had the privilege of worshiping with fellow believers in another culture and another language. And you know that even if you cannot understand the words spoken and perhaps the songs that are sung, there is joy in the fellowship with them because God is there. God is present. He was present with me when I faced jobs that I did not know how to do. If you've talked to any missionaries, you have probably found out that missionaries often have to do things for which they are not trained, uh, for which they are not prepared, and often they did not even want to do the job in the first place. And yet God is our competence. He enables us to do whatever he calls us to do, and he is present with us. He was present with me as I would stand before government officials, hostile government officials, pleading for them to grant my license to practice medicine. Often as, as I experienced that over years, repeatedly, I would feel humiliated. And yet, God was right there. He was present with me. He was present with me as I prayed with patience. He was present with me as I shared my faith in Jesus Christ with my patients and colleagues and friends. Jesus promised to be with us always. In Deuteronomy, it says that it is the Lord who goes before us. He will not leave us. He will not forsake us. And so you can go forward on life's journey with confidence because God is present with you and he will not leave you. Then going on in the psalm, starting in verse 13, we see that God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. These verses are just absolutely overwhelming to me. God is able to do all things. It says here in the psalm that he is the creator. He has created all things. If he has created all things, then obviously he is able to do all things. He created me. He made me the person that I am physically, emotionally, my personality, and he has done the very same thing for each of you. Each of us is an individual. He made us that way. He created us in his image. He created us to be his possession. He created us to have fellowship with him, to have a relationship with him. Each of us is custom designed for an eternal purpose. In verse 14, it says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. In my years in India, besides being a general surgeon, I delivered a lot of babies. It was not something I had prepared for, trained for, didn't really like to do, but it was something that uh, had to be done. And yet, every delivery was such an exciting, awe-inspiring event. Every time I saw that new baby, 
It was so miraculous. Only God could possibly have done this. Otherwise, how could it be possible? It was almost a time of worship. God knows me and he knows you and he desires a relationship with us. God loves each one of us individually. And to put that in the context of an omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God is absolutely mind-boggling. So often I've seen God's power at work in India. God is a God who is able to do miracles. And you've read in the Bible about miracles. And sometimes today we Westerners think that that's something of another time or another place or another era. But I'm here to tell you God is doing miracles today. And I saw these in India from time to time. There, were, there was a small group of believers in the northern part of our state in South India uh, in a village. Uh, a bad hailstorm was coming. Uh, now, I've lived most of my uh, life, not, when I wasn't in India, I was in Texas, and we know about hailstorms. In South India, these people did not know about hailstorms and what really they were like, and these believers were praying. When the storm had passed, all the crops were destroyed except for those belonging to the believers. And the others in the village said to them, who is this God that you pray to that did something like this? There was an Indian church planter just recently who told me this story. There, there's much persecution of Christians in India. And this church planter was out in a, a village alone. He, I don't know what he was doing, whether he was passing out tracts or preaching or something. And a, a very um, violent mob surrounded him. He was frightened. He was praying. They said, we will kill you if you do not uh, renounce your faith. He said he would not renounce his faith. He knew very well that they very well might kill him. Again, they threatened him. Again, he said, I believe only in Jesus Christ. And then he told me, he said, uh, their arms could not be straightened. I said, pardon? Their arms could not be straightened, for you see, God had basically immobilized them. They could not reach out to hit him, attack him, kill him. And the mob just dispersed. Our God is a miracle-working God. I saw God's power at work when he transformed lives. I can tell you a story about a lady named Omni. She was a patient um, of mine. She had come from a far off village. Omni had tuberculosis. It had spread throughout her body. I had operated on her. She basically was dying. All the drugs, everything, nothing was working. We had prayed with her. I had prayed much for her. She had heard about Jesus as she lay there in the ICU. One day, she just began to get better. And um, eventually left the ICU and was in the ward. We had no real explanation for her improvement. And one morning I was making rounds. She said, um, I want to sing a song. Well, you know, I had to get to surgery. I had to finish rounds. There was a lot of work to do. And listening to songs was not on my list. But I thought I had better listen to the song. She began to sing about Jesus. Her story was that as she lay there in the ICU, she had prayed to her Hindu gods. She did not uh, improve. She knew she was dying. And so she decided she should pray to Jesus, and she began to get better. And I thought, ah, she's added Jesus to all those other gods. But then she said, now it does not matter whether I live or die because I know I will be with Jesus. God has the power to transform lives. A few months ago, I was out in, in the villages. Uh, our community health program at Bangalore Baptist Hospital had 
uh, recently begun an alcohol rehabilitation program. Alcoholism is a, a major problem in villages in India. Uh, they had a 12-day de-addiction camp. That day in the village, a group of about eight village men had gathered for their weekly support group meeting. The chaplain was there and she said, get up and tell your story. This little Indian man got up and he began to tell his story of alcohol, a family in disarray, no food to eat, and he went to this 12-day event. They wouldn't let him have any alcohol. And among other things that happened to him was that he heard a story. He then recounted for me the, the story of the prodigal son. And he had heard about a father who forgave his son and who received him back home. And he said, that day I realized there was a God who loved me. There was one true God and that God would forgive me for what I had done. And now I have peace in my heart, there's peace in my house, and we have food to eat. God is able to transform lives. Our God is a powerful God. As the psalmist says, I awake in the morning and I am still with him. His thoughts are more numerous than even the grains of sand. And yet, the problem of evil is still there. We know that. We have only to hear the news uh, every day. Evil is right here around us in this community. It is across the world. It is very hard for us to understand people who turn against God. David in this psalm could not imagine it, nor can we. We're grieved by those who say bad things about God and rebel against God. David then concludes this psalm with a prayer. And that's how this morning we want to conclude our time together. I would challenge you to ask God this morning to search your hearts. Ask him what it is that he intends for your life. God knows you individually. He has a purpose for each of you. God created you to be his child. He loves you. He wants to have a relationship with you. So I would ask you first this morning, do you have a personal relationship with God? Yes, God loved you and created you but sin has separated you from God. And it is only through faith in Jesus Christ that that relationship can be restored. Have you believed in Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord? And most of you in this room have. And if you have, is he Lord of every part of your life? As you sit here this morning, Ask yourself, am I willing to do anything he asks me to do? Am I willing to obey him? And I can assure you, as you submit to his direction and as you obey, wherever that may take you, it may be here, it may be on the other side of the world, God will be with you at all times because he loves you. May we pray. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Father, we just praise and thank you this morning that you are all-knowing, that you are present everywhere, that you are all-powerful. We praise you, for we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you, Lord. We pray this morning that we will truly lay our hearts before you, open ourselves to your direction in our lives. Do with us, Lord, whatever you will do. May we bring glory to you. We worship you. 
we honor you. Lead us in your way everlasting. Amen.